Hey guys, Steve here. I am here with a man named Mike Shreve, who is much more qualified than I am to talk about yoga. Um, I've had a lot of responses to the recent video I made about um, Barbie teaching children how to do yoga stretches. And I've had people comment um, all kinds of things. And so I wanted to bring someone on who is a Christian now, but is literally an expert in this field. Uh, he used to be a teacher, um, taught at four different universities. We're going to uh, allow him to share his background. He taught yoga at four different universities, very extensive background in practice and in research for yoga. So uh, I'd like to introduce Mike Shreve. Thank you for, for coming on, brother. Well, it's a joy. It's a privilege to be with you, Steve. I admire your work and I am rejoicing to communicate with you today on a very important subject. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about your experience in yogic study and um, practice? What kind of qualifies you to speak on these matters in a unique way? Well, as you already mentioned, a number of years ago, actually it was back in 1970, I was a student of Yogi Bhajan and a member of his group. I started two ashrams uh, for Kundalini yoga practices and uh, had about 300 students following my teachings. I was also running a yoga ashram in Tampa, Florida, uh, and uh, as deeply involved as a person can get, I was spending 12 hours a day in solitude, all of that time devoted to various yogic practices that were designed to bring a person to this elusive goal of quote unquote, God consciousness. And I had some very strange supernatural experiences during that time that now I know did not come from God. And so I've been down not only the theological road, but the experiential road. I know what happens when you devote yourself to the yogic uh, pursuit of God and pursuit of oneness with God, and it's not the correct path. Uh, John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. However, as a yoga teacher, I used to quote that scripture and say what Jesus really meant. And those are real trigger words. What Jesus really meant was his I am consciousness is the way to come into oneness with the Father. And I thought I was doing that. And I was, uh, I was oceans away from reality until Jesus came in my life and then everything changed. Right. So here you are. You said that you started two ashrams. You were running a third ashram. And then you taught at four different universities. Were these like Hindu universities? Uh, no, I, actually, I, um, actually, I ran two ashrams. Okay. Uh, the first one I started with some other people and the second one I started myself. But the universities were secular universities in the Tampa area, uh, University of South Florida, University of Tampa, uh, a school in Sarasota, Florida called New College. And also, and this is the shocker, Florida Presbyterian University. They should have known better. And that was my biggest class. I had about 150 students there. And I was not a paid uh, professor. They uh, gave me, that was when the mega trend of all the yogis and swamis and gurus coming into this country were influencing our culture to such a great degree. And it was the hip thing to do at that time. And so they were very open and very excited about giving me the facilities to teach yoga to their students. That's crazy. I did not know that. So it was a Christian university you, you were teaching yoga at? One of them, yes. And, and in fact, uh, at University of South Florida, I taught my yoga classes in the Christian center. So, wow. uh, yeah. So uh, a lot of them were completely unaware they were promoting something very anti-biblical and uh, anti-Christian uh, and just thought it was completely compatible because most people into yoga, especially people into Hatha yoga, think that you can involve yourself in this and it won't disrupt your belief system at all. It's completely compatible with whatever your belief system may be, uh, whether it's Sikh or Christian or Jewish or what have you, they think you can blend in the experience of yoga with that, but you can't. It's inextric inextricably connected to Hinduism. And even Hindu authorities have said there is no Hinduism without yoga and there is no yoga without Hinduism. 
you cannot separate one from the other. So how do you go from teaching yoga at a very high level um, and running two ashrams to saying the things you are now, being a, uh, a Christian and talking about yoga uh, as being dangerous? How did that transition happen? What was the like one aha moment or was this a, ga a gradual process where God led you out? I think I would go beyond calling it just an aha moment. It was absolutely a God-ordained moment where he revealed himself to me in a very supernatural way. In, in fact, I can, in, in short, uh, share my testimony at this point about how I became a follower of Jesus. I was not minded that way at all. I thought Christianity was a lesser path, and you'll understand this term. I thought it was just an expression of bhakti yoga which is devotion to an individual God that was on the same plane with uh, uh, Krishna devotion or some other Hindu God, Vishnu, Shiva, what have you, that uh, Jesus could be stuck in there on a level uh, plane with all of them. Uh, but of course, that's not the case. Uh, and so I was not minded toward becoming a Christian at all. Uh, but a series of events happened that I believe were divinely orchestrated. First of all, uh, the Tampa Tribune newspaper did a half-page article on me. I've still got that article. In fact, I can email it to you. A and uh, it talked about how I was teaching in four universities in that area and running the ashram. And I thought it would increase my class attendance. Little did I know it would alert this prayer group in town to start praying for me. And they were a bunch of radical intercessors that really believed that they could change their city and uh, through connecting with the God who is sovereign and Lord over all, and he can do miraculous things. So they began lifting me up before the Lord on a 24 hour prayer chain, every hour of every day, somebody was seeking God in my behalf. And meanwhile, during that time that I'm being soaked with intercession, uh, an old friend of mine wrote me a letter and told me that he had walked in a church and heard an audible voice say, Jesus is the only way and the Spirit of the Lord fell on him, and he said he was born again, which was a term I had never heard, having been raised Catholic. And that intrigued me. At first, I thought it was just synonymous with the Buddhist term of nirvana, the Hindu term of samadhi, and I was trying to uh, mix it with those terms and their definitions. Uh, but then I, I noticed in the way he wrote that he was talking about something completely different, where... Uh, the Eastern point of view is that to find God, you look within, and this uh, dormant divinity is awakened within you. But he was talking about something external, that a God outside of us had uh, revealed himself to him and come into his heart. So I knew it was a completely different approach that kind of um, blew me away. Uh, I, I just, I couldn't get it off my mind. Of course, it was the Holy Spirit convicting me and drawing me. But uh, one day I decided, hey, I'm a truth seeker, and I've got to at least, uh, instead of just dismissing these claims, I've got to inspect them closer to see if there's any validity to it. So I dedicated an entire day to the Lord Jesus Christ, and I said, if you are the Savior of the world, as my friend claims, and if you are the only way to heaven and the only way to a relationship with God, give me a supernatural sign today. And all I did was pray, read the Bible. The two books I read were the Gospel of John and the Book of Revelation, which is a pretty heavy book to start out with for your initiation to the Bible. And, and so I made it like a commitment not to do any mantra yoga, no Raja yoga meditation, nothing. All I was doing was focusing on Jesus. He was very kind to uh, meet me within... Uh, my uh, confining space of time that I gave to him. Uh, I said, if you're real, if you're the savior of the world, I believe you'll show me today. That afternoon I was hitchhiking to go teach at University of South Florida. And this is so miraculous. One of the members of the prayer group that happened to be a former student of Yogananda, who I, I'm sure you probably heard of. He wrote autobiography of a yogi. Uh, he was a very advanced yoga student probably more advanced than I was in, in some areas. And I'd heard through the grapevine that this guy had dropped out of uh, yoga and was uh, hung up with this bunch of Jesus freaks that said Jesus was the only way. 
So I had heard about him, and he had certainly heard about me because his prayer group was praying for me. What a divine setup in a city as big as Tampa, Florida, over a million people in that region. For him and me to be at the same place at the same time within a five-minute window of time, absolutely miraculous. But anyway, he was walking into a laundromat to do his dirty clothes. He was a student at University of South Florida. And the Holy Spirit spoke to his heart and said, don't go in there. Get back in your van. I've got a job for you to do. That's all the instructions God gave him. He got in his van, started driving, and turned whenever he felt an impulse and drove to the very spot where I was hitchhiking. And when I opened the door to his van, my heart jumped because on the ceiling of the van was a picture of Jesus. I knew it was my answer. And I was waiting for the key question to be asked. And he said, friend, can I ask you a question? I said, yes. He said, have you ever experienced Jesus coming into your heart? I said, no, but when can I? And he gave me this very surprised look. He didn't expect me to respond so positively so quickly. But within 15 minutes, I was on my knees with him in the back of the van, praying and asking Jesus to be Lord of my life and come into my heart. And I was born again. I was regenerated, the Bible called it. And that encounter that I had with the Lord Jesus that day was so strong, so real, so undeniable that I went to my yoga class that afternoon and told them the classes were dismissed from that point forward. The remainder of the week, I went to all of my classes and told them my testimony and canceled the classes. Uh, I don't think uh, you can mix the two. I don't think you can be a yoga teacher and a Christian. And so I shut down everything. I burned all my books on yoga. I shut down the yoga ashram. The the other yoga ashram had already closed uh, by that time. And so I completely extracted myself from that world and began serving the Lord Jesus Christ with all of my heart. And uh, I know without a doubt that was the right thing to do because the Bible does say, come out and be a separated people and do not touch the unclean thing. And God is very clear in Deuteronomy 18 that the reason he ran uh, the Canaanite tribes out of the land that was later inhabited by the Jews was because of their occult practices. That was one of the primary reasons that uh, God wanted to move them out of that region so that their false religious practices would not be mingled with the, the Jewish revelation or understanding of the truth at that time. And I don't think we should mingle now either uh, the truth of God's word and the truth of Christianity with things that are Hindu-based. So how do people who have a background in yoga who, who may be listening to this and, and we're going to get into some kind of like the the meat and substance of yoga and why it's incompatible and how it teaches a, a different unbiblical worldview and how that's incorporated into the practice and so forth but for people who are, are sympathetic to christ but they think but this is my job this is how i feed my family this is how i provide for my kids how can i give my life to Christ and then just go broke. And then like, what, where am I going to work? Like this has been my life for 10 years or 20 years. This was your experience. So what was, what would be a piece of advice to, to them? Well, I suppose the best way of answering that would be to tell you exactly what I told uh, a former yoga teacher uh, about two weeks ago, who is, I've been praying with her. I've been talking with her and uh, she, had been trying to mix the two, being a Christian and yet attending big yoga conferences and going to yoga retreats and things like that. And she just went to one where she had all kinds of dark, demonic things happening to her to the point where she was panicking. She was distraught and she called me desperate. She found me on the internet and I told her, you got to get out of all this. You cannot mix the two you're treading into territory that is dangerous because she was having these Kundalini type, um, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, manifestations of uh, a false kind of energy and power. And uh, she knew it was not God. And I told her, she runs a yoga studio. I told her, I said, get the word yoga out of everything you do. Uh, Quit teaching any class that is associated with yoga. Reduce it to some type of um, 
fitness, uh, 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 some kind of fitness program where you just do bodily exercises and you're not mixing it with the spiritual approach. And I said, you can't just drop your business, you'd go broke, but you can divest yourself of your connection to that world. And that's what I suggested to her. There are ways of doing it. There are plenty of uh, fitness programs that are just just that. They're just fitness programs. They're not associated with any religious expression at all. Right. So you can do like a, a stretching and exercise right. class and just kind of make sure these aren't right. traditional yoga teachers, postures. All their teachers, that's what they were going to. That they would uh, have classes on, on stretching or classes on uh, uh, some type of, uh, they use the word flow. I forget how they exactly said it. But uh, she's very open to that and very ready for that and realizes she's got to make this transition. Right. So keep your passion, keep your field of expertise, whether it's, you know, the human body or fitness, um, but, but change the direction and make sure that these postures are, you know, completely um, devoid of, of Hindu origin. You know, I have a, a friend who was going for yoga certification with Yoga Alliance, and she was a committed Christian at the time. And uh, she told me that they told her up front it would not disrupt her belief system or it would not be a problem for her to get certification and still maintain uh, her worldview uh, as a Christian. And she said she went through it for a couple of days and then they were in a class where one of the teachers asked them all to chant. And she refused to do it because, well, first of all, she didn't believe in chanting. Jesus said, use not vain repetitions like the heathen do. But it was Sanskrit words, and she wasn't going to chant something she didn't understand. So she went up to the teacher afterward, and she said, I, I, can't, I can't participate in a class like this if I don't understand what I'm saying. What do those words mean? And he said, well, those words mean I give my soul to Shiva. And, and, and Shiva, of course, is referred to in Hinduism as the Lord of yoga and the God of destruction. And as a Christian, I know that the quote unquote God of, of destruction and death is Satan. And uh, Shiva is depicted with a snake, a serpent around his neck. And, uh, and, and so to chant, I give my soul to Shiva is an invitation to demonic possession taking place and uh, satanic control and influence in your life. She said, I'm out of here. She said, I'll never be back. And so she left. Uh, and and uh, a, lot of, a lot of Christians think you can be a fully certified yoga teacher with Yoga Alliance and, and still maintain your Christianity. But we live in an hour of mixture and compromise. And I don't think we should be mean and fierce, but we do need to be firm and steady in our commitment to the truth. Amen. So when we talk about yoga, there's a few different terms that have been um, used, one being kundalini and kundalini yoga and um, hatha yoga. Is there a difference between the two? Um, how, would we, how would we parse those two different terms? Well, yes, there's a huge difference between the two, but uh, kundalini yoga actually incorporates hatha yoga into what it promotes. Uh, let me define the word yoga first, and I'm sure you're well familiar with this, that the word yoga means literally yoke, and the implication is that you become yoked with Brahman, or you come into union with Brahman, which is ultimate reality in Hinduism. Brahman is the highest expression of the Godhead, impersonal cosmic force uh, that is not a personal God, it's the life force that flows through the entire universe. And, and that's their conception of God on the highest level, that God is an impersonal being. And uh, so the very fact that you're saying, I am going to a yoga class, well, you might as well say, I want my soul to be united with Brahman, because you're saying the same thing. In fact, there's a mudra, that, uh, which is a symbolic hand motion that most people use when they're doing yoga, which is the circular sign of the four fingers. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna make that the thumbnail for the YouTube video, you doing that, and it's gonna be Illuminati exposed all over. Okay, YouTube. well anyway, that represents my individual soul being united with the oversoul, uh, which is Brahman, 
And when I connect the two together, it represents coming into God consciousness or being in union with Brahman. And uh, wow, so I, I'm never going to do that, not uh, consciously in an effort to uh, make that kind of thing happen. I may represent it right now on our conversation, but I don't mean it as, <laughs> uh, uh, as if I'm beckoning this power, this evil spirit to come because I'm not. So that would be, so how does that differ from Kundalini yoga in particular? Right. Well, Hatha yoga primarily uh, focuses on asanas, which are the physical exercises and pranayama, which are the breathing exercises uh, that are supposed to prepare you for the higher levels of yoga. Uh, it's supposed to position you uh, to receive the supernatural experiences that come with kundalini yoga. The whole focus in kundalini yoga is the awakening of the kundalini, which is depicted as a coiled serpent at the base of the spine. It's supposed to be symbolic of the latent divinity or the dormant divine nature within every human being. And that most people are not influenced by it uh, or aware of it at all. They just live very flesh focused lives confined within the boundaries of the five senses. But then uh, a yoga devotee, a lini yoga devotee is focused, whether he's doing hatha yoga, raja yoga, bhakti yoga, karma yoga, or uh, the kundalini yoga that is focused on awakening this power. That's their whole goal. Uh, and the supposed idea behind it is that at a certain point in meditation or at a certain point in your practice, the kundalini is awakened like a serpent striking and it comes up to the third eye and then to the crown chakra. And all these are not literal things they're imaginary terms. Uh, they don't exist. There's no such thing as chakras. There's no such thing as the kundalini. And I want to make that clear, but in their teaching, then that's when a person uh, leaves his or her body and blends in with the oversoul and you uh, have this experience of God consciousness and you're liberated then from this, uh, what a Christian would call carnal consciousness or being confined to just uh, uh, this fleshly existence, then you're on a much higher level. And that's the whole focus of Kundalini Yoga. Uh, there's a few things though I need to say. It's represented as a serpent. And we know that biblically, a serpent is symbolic of that which is evil. Uh, going back to the Garden of Eden, Satan depicted as a serpent. Uh, well, it's still symbolic of that which is evil. And uh, to me, that was the enemy revealing the source of the power and then uh, People didn't even pick up on it. It's like, it's like the enemy was revealing uh, that this is dark, this is occultic, this is evil, and then laughing because we didn't even sense the danger of what we were doing. Uh, but um, uh, in New Age circles, a serpent is uh, supposedly symbolic of esoteric wisdom. And so they, they think the serpent is a very positive symbol. And in Hinduism, uh, the serpent is supposedly a very positive symbol. And so biblically, it means something much different. But I, I believe when a person experiences this supposed awakening of the Kundalini, it is a, uh, uh, to be very blatant about it, it is demonic possession. It is the manifestation of a demon spirit coming into a person because they practice these occult methods in trying to achieve God consciousness and you can't get there. You can't, you can't come into union with God. You can't have oneness with God unless you go through the cross, the resurrection, the name of Jesus, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way. And even then the, the, the biblical sense of oneness with, with God would be um, we don't share deity with God. We don't share ontology with God. We're of a different nature. And if you contrast that, like the Bible says, you know, put fear in them, O Lord, the nations, now they are but men. Um, the Egyptians are man and not God. Their horses are flesh and not spirit. Um, so there's this union of oneness of spirit, oneness of purpose, oneness of, of mission with God. We're, we're reconciled into 
intimacy relationship with him. And in that sense, we're one again. You know, we were separated, now we're one, but we don't share ontology. So that's more or less like a biblical idea of, of oneness. Now, if we were to contrast that with what, um, you know, yoga teachers teach and Hinduism teaches in particular, um, I want to read a quote right now that I pulled uh, from your book. This one's called In Search of the True Light. Um, I'm going to include a link to it in the description of this video. And it's very comprehensive. I was impressed when I was reading it and, and scanning through it because you're basically looking at each individual category, God, man, you know, eschatology or, or what people believe about our final state, our eternal state, the afterlife, and you're contrasting each different world religion, sourcing primary quotes so people can really see the difference between what the Bible teaches versus what, I don't know, Benjamin Cream teaches or uh, Hinduism teaches or Mormonism teaches, for example. So it's a very uh, helpful resource and uh, I would recommend that to people. But here's a quote I, I pulled from it by someone named Swami Sri Yukteswar. I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong. Quote, yeah, that, that was the guru that Yogananda was under, yeah. Okay. In, in that lineage. Right. He says, our consciousness or soul is a spark of the cosmos, cosmic consciousness of God. God is the essence of our own being. He is yourself. He exists equally and impartially in all beings. Um, now, we've already established that that's really the ultimate goal of yoga is union with the cosmic consciousness, union with Brahman. But we can see parallels here, I think, and I'd like your commentary on this, not just with the snake um, symbolism, which we clearly see a, a parallel between that and Satan, but also the initial lie told in the Garden of Eden that through some kind of secret wisdom from eating from the tree, the knowledge of good and evil, through some kind of secret knowledge or special knowledge, special class of knowledge, in this case, the knowledge of self, you can become godlike. You can become as one of the gods. You can become as God. And that's really why he doesn't want you to eat it. He doesn't want you to become divine like him because he always, you know, jealous and all these weird things. He's petty and he's a control freak. So here comes Satan to really liberate mankind with free will and so forth. But do we see a parallel between the initial lie Satan told and this idea that you can become as God through special knowledge of self? Well, certainly. And the, the main contrast, Steve, is that in Hinduism, to become one with God is to come to a conscious realization that you are God. In fact, some of the gurus, many of the gurus teach that you should not pray to God because that's a failure to recognize that that's who you are. That <laughs> the individual soul, and Brahman, the oversoul, are one and the same. And you're absolutely right, and it's so good that you brought out this point, that oneness with God, we're using the same term, but it complete, uh, completely uh, differs in interpretation. Oneness with God in Christianity is a blending of our spirit with the Holy Spirit, where we have the indwelling presence of God, but we never, never become God. Uh, to even think such a thing would be heretical and blasphemous. We never become God. We are sons and daughters of God in a beautiful union with God because he's poured his spirit into us. And, uh, and, and that's joy unspeakable and full of glory. There's nothing to compare with that. And now, uh, yes, I, I have communion with God on a daily basis. I, I feel his presence in my life, but there's never a point where he and I become one in the same. That's heretical. And uh, of course, that's what the New Age offshoot in Islam teaches, the Sufis. Uh, that's what New Age spirituality teaches. That's what Hinduism teaches. It filters through to a lot of different worldviews. It's the same deception termed different ways. It's what Oprah Winfrey teaches. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And uh, Deepak Chopra and a lot of the teachers I was involved with, uh, David Wilcock and so forth. And I would see them build a case, first of all, for the necessity of invoking um, the reality of an impersonal field of consciousness. So they'll basically infer the existence of a unified field or universal field of consciousness um, and then say that we ultimately are that. that that's ultimately the source field, the super string field. Um, the field talked about an M theory. Yes, it's a unified field, but it's a field of, you know, impersonal consciousness, dynamic consciousness. And that was the worldview that convinced me. Um, and clearly it's anti-biblical. Um, Old Testament, New Testament has nothing to do with reality. 
And yeah, there's a difference between the Holy Spirit um, dwelling with, within us and mingling with us and sharing, uh, you know, space with us and us being omnipresent. Like those are two very, very different things. Huge. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, you mentioned that field of consciousness. Uh, I, I believe it'd be a great place to insert this little thing. I used to teach as a yoga teacher that Jesus spent the years from 12 to 30 or a great portion of those years in India studying under the swamis and the gurus in order to awaken his Christ nature. And then he came back, of course, to promote his ideas uh, from 30 years old and onward. Uh, I do not agree with that now at all. And, and I think uh, one of the real revealing things uh, concerning the falsehood of that idea is that the two main proponents that are quoted all the time is, is the Aquarian Gospel. Uh, Levi Dowling, uh, who wrote the Aquarian Gospel, has a section about Jesus going to India. And then Edgar Cayce uh, uh, gave the same idea. However, when you go and look at what they taught, is com a completely different storyline. And they both claim to get their revelations from this field of knowledge, this field of consciousness that's been called the Akashic Records, mm -hmm. that they tapped into that and got this information. Well, why did their accounts totally contradict each other? Because it's untrue, it's false, it's deception. Because if Jesus had even come back promoting Far Eastern ideas in Israel, then that would have been the cause for the Jewish authorities to rebuke him and resist his teaching. And they never brought that up because to them, that paganism was completely unacceptable and heretical. And they would have nailed Jesus uh, on that false doctrine if he had promoted it. But you never find any record of that taking right. place. Why don't the very enemies of Jesus say, hey, he's a pagan. Hey, he's promoting, you know, strange teachings from other religions. They don't. They're basically more or less just offended at him and offended at his teachings because he always talked about how hard in their heart they were. He was a monotheistic Jew through and through, affirm the Old Testament, the word of God, um, that God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that he was the Messiah to, you know, give his life as a ransom for many. And... Um, so I want to switch back to yoga real quick here. Um, something that is, has come up in my research and that seems to be more and more confirmed the more I look into it is this idea that yoga postures, at least some of them, uh, are named after polytheistic deities. Not all of them. It doesn't seem all of them are, but some of them are. And I recently did a video and one of the examples I gave was uh, Varabhadrasana 3. Uh, and there's three different poses within the Varabhadrasana sequence, also known as, known as the warrior sequence, where you have this story about Shiva wanting to marry Daksha's daughter, and he won't let him, or they did get married, and he didn't attend the wedding, and Sati, I believe, was her name that he wanted to marry, and she got upset. There's multiple different ways that explain different um, mythologies telling us, you know, different things about why Shiva got mad at Daksha, but basically he throws a fit and creates out of himself Varabhadrasana, this thousand-headed monster who goes and kills Daksha, cuts his head off. And the first two warrior poses that people do, if you go to any yoga studio, if you go to uh, doing yoga classes on online, at home even, you're doing warrior one, warrior two, warrior three, you're imitating. The first pose is something like this, the second one's like this, and the third one is like this. And the third pose is where you are enacting, you know, Shiva in the form of Varabhatra, cutting off the head of Daksha and placing it on a stake. So mm -hmm. you're literally mimicking a polytheistic murder scene with your body. One false god killing another false god for no good reason. And when I was reading through your book, this other one here I'm going to hold up, uh, Seven Reasons I No Longer Practice Yoga, I learned something interesting. I didn't know this. And I want to speak, uh, get you to speak on this as well, is that when people are chanting Aum, um, that's something I would chant as well. Um, you pointed out that each consonant, actually rep A-U-M, it represents a different deity in, in the pantheon uh, right. of Hindu gods. Right. Uh, well, that's a teaching that Hindus traditionally give, 
that the correct pronunciation of om is stretching it out where you make a a u m sound i'm not going to try and mimic it here but the a sound represents brahma who is the cre supposedly the creator god the uh, u sound represents vishnu who is the preserver god and then the m represents shiva who is the destruction the god of destruction and and so when you chant that word and i used to just as i'm sure you did uh i used to chant it hundreds thousands of times and it's an invitation to these three gods to come into your life to merge with your soul to influence you and so I, i've had Christians tell me, well, I go to the yoga studio and I do the exercise, but when they start chanting Om, I just say Jesus instead. I don't want to be in the room where people are uttering phrases that are acknowledgments of false gods. That would be like walking in a, a temple of idolatry and participating in the service. I cannot imagine Jesus and his disciples visiting a yoga studio and when that went on, just very passively sitting to the side and not participating. He wouldn't have even gone in there to start with. He would lovingly reach out to the people, but he would not participate in their rituals or their, uh, their approaches. And so um, I just don't see how people can mingle the two. And in my book that you just mentioned, and I really appreciate uh, you uh, mentioning that, uh, my last argument in that book, and the first six, I think, are powerful enough by themselves. But my last argument in that book is even if a yoga studio appears to be completely benign, there's no meditating going on, no chanting, uh, no Hindu music being played in the background. It's just all uh, the Hatha yoga type exercises and the pranayama breathing exercises. And, <clears throat> and, and there's no spiritual influence whatsoever. Still, by going to a quote-unquote yoga studio, you are endorsing something that is very dark at its core. And so even if you're not meditating, not chanting, not uh, consciously doing these poses as acts of worship to individual deities, and, and you think it's silly to even go there in our thinking, Still, you are endorsing a system that does uphold those as being realities uh, and uh, those ideas as being truth. And so um, I don't think Christians should participate. I don't feel anyone should participate. And I, I've seen and, and heard a kind of a counter argument presented that, well, you know, to the pure all things are pure kind of thing, you know, they'll quote from 1 Corinthians 10 where Paul's talking about um, how it's okay in principle to eat food that is offered unto idols. So there's been food that was part of some kind of ritual ceremony, and now it's in the marketplace being sold. And he says, don't ask questions about it on grounds of conscience. Um, he's basically like, you know, you say it's sanctified with prayer, and people are saying, well, there, there you go. There's a pagan, something that's pagan that's sanctified with, with prayer. But they miss what he says in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 20 to 22 where he gives them an extremely strong rebuke for being participants in the services themselves and being involved in the actual temple worship themselves. And says you can't sit at the table of the Lord and the table of demons. You can't drink of the cup of the Lord in the cup of demons. Are we going to provoke the Lord to jealousy? Because he says, I imply, he says, I imply what pagans offer unto idols, they offer unto demons. So Paul makes this contrast. You're partaking of something that is intrinsically part of God's creation, like grapes. And they're not, you yourself are not participating in a pagan service. The grapes were a part of it. Now they're being sold in the market. You were not a participant. You yourself were not involved in anything that looks like pagan worship or can be equated to pagan worship. That's different than going into the temple, being a part of this meeting, uh, this ceremony, this ritual altar ceremony to, I don't know, Shiva or something, or Thor or Zeus or whatever god they would have been worshiping, worshiping them, Athena, I don't know. And then when they start chanting Athena's name or Zeus's name, you just say Yahweh in your head a couple times and you're participating, you're going through the, the ritual with them. 
those are two very, very different things. And yoga falls into the, the second core category because you are directly involved in the service ritual yourself. You're not merely partaking of a byproduct of it, such as grapes or meat that's been offered on titles. And you end up corrupting a person who is weaker, that doesn't have the filter system you may have. Because uh, a Christian who really understands uh, the doctrinal base that we adhere to as Bible believers may, and, and, and I'm qualifying my statement very carefully, may be able to go into a yoga studio and discern what is false and what is neutral and what, or what may possibly be true and differentiate between those and not partake of the things that's false or a person may claim to be able to do that. But then a weaker person that's not so knowledgeable about the Bible can see you going to a yoga studio and they think, well, it must be okay. And then they participate, they involve themselves and they end up uh, getting corrupted uh, by the system and their whole faith biblically erodes as a result. And so it's part of the reasoning Paul gives there to the Corinthians is not to do it because you could hinder a brother who is weak. Uh, and, and and if he sees you eating food that was offered to an idol, he may think that you are actually endorsing the worship of that idol, and so you destroy that brother for whom Christ died. And, and, and it's the same kind of situation, perfect right. analogy. Yeah, and what Paul would be saying there would be um, in reference to the first example I described, what he talks about earlier, prior to 1 Corinthians 10.20, where it's meat or food offered unto idols. He's like, that's when you have to be aware of other people's um, consciences around you. That's when you don't want to cause your brothers to stumble. He's like, that's when it becomes a matter of, you know, um, pleasing everything and all things. Like he says at the end of 1 Corinthians 12, you want to make sure that you're not causing someone to stumble and look at that and be like, oh, he's partaking in paganism. That does, that's, he doesn't use that same argument for 1 Corinthians 10 verses 20 to 22 where the Christians are actively involved in temple ceremony themselves. He was only applying that to partaking kind of of the byproduct, like the food that was offered unto idols. Right. So, pe so people will say, you know, well, if it's just a matter of conscience, it doesn't disturb mine. You know, there's no other Christians there. Nobody sees me. Maybe I'm doing it at, in the privacy of my own home and nobody is around me and I don't tell anybody. It's just my secret thing. Um, nobody's conscience is being disturbed. Yeah, but he brings in a stronger argument for direct participation. And, and yoga would definitely fall under that. Um, now we've talked a little, we've talked a little bit about the the practical dangers um, of yoga. Okay, so I believe personally, I'd like your commentary on this. That there's like all sin, there's varying degrees of offense in the eyes of God, and therefore there's varying degrees of danger. Um, there's varying degrees of sin. Um, all sin is worthy of hell. All sin requires the blood of Jesus to be forgiven, but not all sin is equal in the eyes of God. Um, shooting up a, a school is different in the eyes of God than just think. Sure. They're not, they're not, they don't carry the same weight and the same offense, and therefore not, they don't open you up to the demonic in quite the same way. If you stub your toe and say the S word, that's much different on a, spiritual level than you plotting for a year how you're going to cheat on your neighbor's wife and then go do it like completely different thing both sin both require the blood of jesus don't get me wrong now when it comes to yoga i feel like there's varying degrees of danger depending on the set and setting depending on for example chanting i would say at the very bare bones minimum you are at the very least doing something that can weaken your faith disturb your christian worldview i believe grieve the spirit of god the spirit of god is why we're christians nobody says jesus is lord by the holy spirit right the spirit of god is the spirit of truth he leads us into all truth he testifies of christ convicts us of sin righteousness and judgment i don't necessarily need to be doing something that is opening me up to the demonic all i need to be doing something is this all i need to be doing is something that is grieving the spirit of god and that's bad enough that's dangerous enough so I would say there's some things that grieve the spirit of God and can threaten our walk with him because of that and threaten our faithfulness to a biblical worldview because of all these, this subconscious repetitive influence of, of Hinduism. 
we would range from that danger, which is more of like a, a worldview. My, my walk with God could be destroyed or shipwrecked even um, to full on demonic oppression and even worse, demonic possession. Would you agree that there's varying degrees of error? And if so, how would you parse that? Oh, absolutely. Um, there are degrees of sin. Uh, and that's very scriptural. Uh, and there's varying degrees of danger as you progress up the yoga ladder in the type of practices you involve yourself in. In fact, I, I might reference that the guru I studied under used to teach us that if we supposedly prematurely awakened the kundalini, that it could result in insanity, it could result in dark occultic powers being awakened in us, it could result in demonic visitations in our life. And, and so that's supposedly why you had to prepare yourself with certain disciplines so that you would be ready when it happened. Well, I have never found a place in the Bible where somebody met the Lord and it resulted in insanity, dark occultic powers being awakened in them or uh, any other negative thing for that matter. So if that is the result of the awakening of this serpent power, where is the power coming from? Is coming from Satan. It's coming from satanic powers that work under him. It's a, a veiled counterfeit for the real experience of God. But you mentioned something too about uh, chanting mantras. And I'd, I'd like to insert this thought about that practice. Not only is it ineffective in reaching God, I personally believe chanting mantras is an insult to the intelligence of God. Uh, why do I say that? Because you're a personal being. I'm a personal being. I'm communicating with you right now. If I were to take a seven word statement and repeat it a thousand times to you in this interview, how quickly would you turn the camera off? <laughs> Right? Because you don't need me to repeat something over and over and over again. You say, I get it, man. You said it once. That's enough. And, and God is much more intelligent than you or I uh, could claim to be. And so when you approach him, why did Jesus say, use not vain repetitions like the heathen do? For they think that they'll be heard for their much speaking. Because he understood that God is a personal God and you approach him in a personal way with a flow of conversation, uh, a flow of prayerful conversation, including thanksgiving and praise and worship that comes from the sincerity of your heart. Uh, if, if God was just an impersonal force, then quoting or saying some mantra over and over again in order to manipulate that power and channel that power would make sense, uh, that you could somehow control that energy by the right kind of mystical words. But God is not an force. He's a personal God. And to approach him in the style of using a mantra, even if it's in contemplative prayer and you use a prayer word that is biblical, I still believe it's an insult to God's intelligence. You don't approach God with a repetitive, monotone sound any more than you would another human being. And uh, an analogy I've given in the past is like, if I wanted to have a conversation with a person, like someone sitting right in front of me, I'm not going to start doing breathing techniques to try and shift my consciousness and start huffing and puffing. And I'm not going to drop five grams of psilocybin mushrooms in order to attempt to communicate with you. I'm just going to look you in the face and talk to you. Right. And that's, that's the way God wants to be approached. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> um, so, we agree that there's varying degrees of sin, varying degrees of error. Um, what would you say to someone like this who is saying, you know what, I understand the spiritual roots, the spiritual foundation of yoga, the origin of the postures, but I want to practice, you know, I'm not going to do chanting. I'm not going to do the mudras. I'm not going to um, consciously serve any other deity other than Jesus. Maybe I'll even play worship music. Um, during my, my time doing yoga. Uh, I had someone very close in my life recently say that when she was making a transition to the faith, she would do yoga and, you know, play worship music, have a worship playlist with like Hillsong on it and stuff and do yoga to it until God was like, no, that's it. 
and then she got radically born again and she used to teach yoga as well. Um, but so what do you say to someone like that though? Who's just like, you know what? I'm just going to do the stretching. I'm just going to do the asanas, just the stretching, no worldview stuff, no chanting, no involved, no incense burning, no statues, no yoga studio. Even I'm going to go to the park and, you know, drink a Starbucks and wear Lululemons and just do it in the privacy of, you know, cause I love the stretching. Like, what would you say to something like that? Well, there, there are stretches that a person can do with the human body that don't necessarily identify it with yoga. Uh, but if a person has been a yoga practitioner and, and they stop referencing some of the spiritual aspects of it, but they still continue with the same postures, subliminally, psychologically, I believe that they still connect with what they formerly practiced. That's and it right. could be uh, it could be an open door, an open invitation to the spirits that once influenced them to continue in their influence. Uh, personally, if I work out, I just go to the gym and work out. I don't assume any yoga pose or yoga type pose uh, that I used to because I just don't. I once I extracted myself from that world, I didn't want any connection with that world. Because that word took me away from God. Why would I mingle with it? Why would I try and, and promote it at the same time I'm promoting biblical truth? I'm not going to do that. Right. So let's say a, uh, a Christian or someone who isn't Christian but has been involved in, in yoga. Let's say that they're convinced that this is something they don't want to be involved in. Um, what are the first steps practically speaking and, and, and logistically speaking that they should take in order to, you know, begin to transition their life away from this. You know, if someone who's been in that position, what would be the first thing you would tell someone who has that conviction come, I'm done with yoga. Um, again, I, I believe the important thing would be not to have any area in their present physical regimen, whatever they're doing, in order to uh, uh, deal with, with physical health, uh, that they should steer away from anything that reminds them of what they were involved in before. Uh, I, I have been confronted with some of the Chris, Christian yoga groups that still meditate on the chakras. And, and I tell them, if, if you believe in the chakras, that means you have to accept the Kundalini too. And if you accept the idea of the Kundalini, you are entering into a realm that is completely dark and, and demonic. Uh, I, I, I said, you can't mix the two. And I, I have very mixed reactions sometimes, sometimes very hostile reaction because they feel like it's perfectly normal, and perfectly uh, righteous and good to, to mix the two together. Right. And you made a good, uh, good point as well about um, psychologically and emotionally kind of when we position ourselves in the same container, the same environment that we've had an experience in time and time and time again, um, when we enter into that position another time, even with a different worldview, our brain is so used to snapping into that state that it's right. going to happen against our will because of a, a, a property our brain has called neuroplasticity where it creates certain neural pathways conditioned around an event or an experience. And I use that same argument for people with, with crystals, for example. They say, well, you know, I have all these crystals. First of all, if you bought them from a metaphysical shop, I would say throw them out for sure. But they're like, well, I used to use them in divination and I want to keep them because they're pretty. Um, what do I do with them? Do I just pray over them? And my, my thing is, okay, you're, you're used to having mystical altered states spiritually enhanced states while using these crystals. And so what's going to, even if you've repented, give your life to Christ, you're going to go over to the crystal, your brain, your mind, your emotions, everything is used to snapping and reacting and responding a certain way. It's just basic conditioning. Um, so why would you want to put that yourself in a, a risky position like that, where, as you said, it can open up a door to the demonic, but also it can open up a door for you to become weak in your faith and start second guessing yourself and maybe it feels kind of cool maybe you remember all this nostalgia and good memories start flooding back in um it's not worth the risk you know well it's not um it's not worth the risk 
In the book that uh, you held up a while ago, The Seven Reasons I No Longer Practice Yoga, uh, there's a couple of other things we haven't referenced yet that I believe are really important, uh, Steve, and we might want to at least touch on them. Yeah, please do. Expound on them. But uh, I list seven, the seven things right at the beginning, and they are uh, the seven reasons that I believe a, a Christian should not practice yoga are, number one, the spiritual foundation of yoga, which we've covered very well, uh, which involves the idea of pantheism. Pantheism is the idea that the universe is an emanation of God, and therefore everything has a divine essence at its core, and, and so human beings have a divine essence at their core. And to do yoga is to concentrate inwardly where you can become one with that divine essence again. And that's the whole basis of the yogi uh, approach. Number two is spiritual perspective. Number three is spiritual deception. Number three, four is spiritual transfer, which is an important point I want to bring out. And number five is spiritual intrigue. And uh, number six is spiritual endorsement. And number seven is spiritual compromise. Uh, of course, I'd have to elaborate on all seven of those. And, and we can't. We wouldn't have time. But uh, the spiritual transfer thing, I think, is very important. Because when you sit under someone, when you sit under a yoga teacher uh, in a class that has been stripped of all its spiritual elements, but that teacher is given over to a new age worldview or to a Hindu worldview. Uh, that teacher embraces the Far Eastern approach. Then whatever spirit that teacher is of is going to flow through that person as the class goes on. And, and you may be surrounded with people that are of the same mindset. And so you are in an atmosphere that is not pervaded with the Holy Spirit. You are in an atmosphere that is uh, contaminated with other spirits and a spiritual transfer can take place that over a period of time has an erosive uh, effect on you and on your faith. And so uh, uh, the, on the highest level, uh, the, uh, the gurus I studied under taught something called Shaktipat, where they said uh, there was a certain point where a follower was ready, a disciple was ready for them, Sometimes they would lay hands on uh, their devotees or maybe had a certain ritual like striking their forehead with a feather or whatever to awaken the Kundalini where they would impart to them this spiritual awakening. Well, really what it was was a transfer of demons. And, uh, and, and that's in the atmosphere of a yoga class when the person at the head of that class even if they've stripped it of its spiritual elements and it's just a hot yoga class where you're burning up a bunch of calories, still you're in an atmosphere that is dangerous. Absolutely. That is uh, interesting for me, particularly because I've been doing a little bit of um, investigation, I guess you can say on the side, some you know silent investigation on certain patterns and I guess things that I've noticed and seen, um, I don't even want to necessarily say the body of Christ because I don't know how much of it is at the hands of people who are actually saved, but in, in Christianity or what's being promoted as Christianity, uh, you will see examples of impartation, as, as you described, the putting on the hand. I've seen not only the putting of the hand on people's forehead, but also like blowing, like blowing on their forehead to give them impartation, resulting in paralysis, resulting in um, convulsions and screaming and, uh, you know, very strange twitching and mannerisms and stuff like that. Things that seem to be characteristic of what, if you search online, what the manifestations of a Kundalini awakening would be. And so there's this idea in the body of Christ that just like you can have spiritual transfer resulting in some kind of spiritual energy manifesting in you in paganism, but that's, you know, someone's mingling with another spirit. Someone's given over to a false entity. They've chased after, I don't know, mysticism and they value the supernatural or experience more than being a disciple of Jesus. And now they've been deceived and now they're imparting this yoke and this spirit to someone else. And it's resulting in weird twitches. Now people will say, well, you know, this is a kundalini spirit, you know, in, in the church. Um, for me, it's been more of 
my initial hesitation was how can we say it's all the same spirit? Um, like it might not be necessarily accurate grammatically to say that's a Kundalini demon, that's a Kundalini demon. I do believe there's something demonic going on there. What are your thoughts on that? Do you see a parallel between that? Do you think it's a Kundalini demon? What, what do you think? If I get emails on any subject, it's on this one because people are in a quandary. They want to know what's real, what's not real right. is going on in the move of God in our world. And uh, I am a Pentecostal charismatic. I believe in the nine gifts of the spirit. I believe in the power of God. I believe in healing and miracles. I myself have had tremendously powerful visions and uh, dreams from God that have directed my life. I've had many amazing miracles. I Just two weeks ago, a uh, pastor's wife, we laid hands on her, prayed over her. She had COPD. Uh, it was incurable. Uh, she feared that her life might be coming to a close. And we prayed for her. She has before and after doctor's records. She's completely healed of the COPD. So I, I've seen some people react to some of the supernatural things that go on in the name of Christianity, and they pull back from all of it. And I believe in the process, they throw out the baby with the bathwater. There is a legitimate expression of the Holy Spirit. Uh, let me reference your question about the quote unquote Kundalini spirit first, though. I, I don't wanna fail to respond to that. I personally do not believe that there is any such thing as a Kundalini spirit because you don't find that in the Bible. That's extra biblical to even identify a specific demon with that specific purpose of a Kundalini spirit. Now, there may be demon spirits that affect people in a similar way, but I don't believe it's accurate to actually call it a Kundalini spirit. And I believe you and I have talked about this before, and I believe we're on the same page about it. However, I do believe that there are some genuine Christians that sincerely love God that have gone after the supernatural and gone beyond the boundary of the true manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And I've had many of them come to my meetings uh, because, uh, and let me back up and say, we, we at times in our meetings have seen people fall out under the power of God. I think there are times when it's actually true and real and not learned behavior or not uh, something that people convince themselves of. Uh, and we have seen people shake under the power of God that I believe was genuine. But I've also seen some moves of God or supposed moves of God where there was a lot of weird, strange twitching and jerking and and grunting sounds and animal sounds. And uh, it just went beyond what I witnessed to as being real. And I do believe in certain circles, uh, without naming any particular group, in certain circles in Canada and the United States of America, I believe genuine Christians have fallen prone to deceiving spirits. And, and uh, there is... Uh, a categorization of spirits that way. And I think all spirits are deceiving spirits. All demons are deceiving spirits that have led them into a false experience of the supernatural. And I believe it's very dangerous because it's misrepresenting the true move of God. And uh, I believe the people that are indulging in that, involving themselves in that, need to step back and say, now, wait just a second. Is this biblical? Is this correct? Is this right? And I believe if they really sincerely with a Berean kind of attitude, uh, if they really sincerely uh, look at what's going on and, and compare it to what's biblical, they won't find any precedent for it. Like uh, to give a, an example, many, many years ago, uh, it's not so prevalent now, but many years ago, uh, I, I had some people come to my meetings that were really into the laughing movement and I even got invited to a church that I didn't really know was heavily into that. And uh, when I went to the church, they, I don't care if the preacher was talking about the judgment of God or something very bland like uh, talking before an offering, the whole congregation would be cackling in an insane kind of way. And, and my explanation to them 
uh, to the leaders there and my explanation after that to others was, wait a second, if a human being says something and then they show emotion that is completely different than the words that they speak, that's a sign of insanity. Uh, because if I'm saying something like my Aunt Mildred passed away and then I begin cackling and laughing, then they'll say something's wrong with this guy mentally because his emotion <laughs> and his mind are not synced. And, and if a person in the pulpit is preaching on a serious subject and the Holy Spirit is out there in the audience engendering all kinds of wild, crazy laughter, then uh, that's both from the same sources, the Word of God and the Spirit of God, but the Spirit of God is not in sync with the Word of God. And so God is insane. If that kind of manifestation is a true manifestation, God is insane. And of course, that is not the case, and that is not true. So I believe a lot of these charismatic megatrends have taken the true move of the power of God that happens. I've seen the deaf receive their hearing. I've seen the blind receive their sight. I've seen people receive undeniable miracles. It's true God moves in the supernatural, but there's been a tendency of carrying it to the extreme that goes beyond the boundaries of what is right and true. And I believe we need to bring balance and adjust that in the body of Christ, if we're going to be healthy spiritually. I agree. I agree fully. And there's a, uh, a quote from someone named Dr. Sam Storms, um, an amazing charismatic teacher uh, on, on the gifts of the spirit. He's actually associated with uh, Desiring God, John Piper's ministry. And um, <clears throat> I mean, I would recommend people to, to his material. If you want to study the gifts of the spirit in a container where you're studying under someone who's biblically qualified to teach you, who has experience teaching at seminary, who has testimonies, who is serving as a pastor in a viable local church and is associated with a very credible ministry. Um, Sam Storms is a great resource. Uh, Be the Beginner's Guide to Spiritual Gifts would be one book. Um, <clears throat> Practicing the Power would be uh, another book. Uh, Heavenly Languages would be a third book on, on tongues. And I personally identify as charismatic as well. I just believe it's what scripture describes. Um, I've never had a miracle come through my life. I've heard amazing testimonies, one of which I want you to, to share in, in just a moment. Um, but I think it's what the Bible teaches. And I do think that hard cessationism grieves the spirit of God. Um, if you're going to say God does not and will not operate this way anymore, I believe that as uh, Sam Storms has said, you know, it quenches the spirit. If you go to desiringgod.com, he has an article called Seven Ways the Holy Spirit's Quenched. And like three or four of them have to do with denying the gifts of the spirit. Why? Because when the Bible commands you to do things like forbid not speaking in tongues, but you go ahead and forbid speaking in tongues, or the Bible says despise not prophecies, and you despise them, or the Bible says earnestly desire the higher gifts, especially that you may prophesy, or desire the gifts, um, and you don't desire anything, and you rebuke those who do, you're not subscribing to God's commandments. And so there's a grievance of the spirit, a quenching of the spirit, because you're, first of all, I believe it's walking in disobedience, but um, you're also placating a very important part of the Holy Spirit's ministry. The, full, the spirit wants to come in its fullness into our lives, in, into our church. And there's this kind of dichotomy that gets painted in the body of Christ, which I don't like, where you have the, you know, skinny jeans, highbrow camp where, well, God doesn't use that anymore. He did that to, you know, confirm the gospel and he stopped doing that, you know, uh, when the canon was closed. And, and that's kind of like the highbrow way of, of seeing these things. Um, but you have people who are very spiritually dry and thirsty and they're hungry and maybe they come out of the new age movement and they're used to seeing the supernatural all the time. They're used to seeing moves of different spirits. Maybe they're used to seeing counterfeit miracles. They go to Reiki, they experience a um, a, a, an increase in their back pain. They think, oh, so wait a minute, uh, demons are going to give me miracles, but God, God doesn't do that. He's not willing to do that for me, but he's going to move in. Uh, demons are going to move in power in my life when I'm in the new age when I come to God and, and there's no spiritual component to my life whatsoever. I just read the Bible and, you know, make sure I'm not believing anything supernatural is going to happen in my life because that's dangerous. Um, and it, I, I do believe that that kind of provokes people to 
look at the new age more sympathetically um, because it's a, a more spiritually rich option than going to like, I don't know, a, a cessationist Methodist church, for example, they go there as dry as liturgical and they think that's not very spiritually rich. Like there's, where's the presence of God here? You know what I mean? And so um, I do think it kind of does a disservice and maybe even predisposes people to the new age movement, hard cessationism along with grieving the spirit. Um, but he has a quote, this all to say, he has a quote, he says, Christians are really good, uh, Dr. Sam Storm says, uh, we're really good at um, obeying the 11th commandment. You shall not do at all what other people do poorly. So just because people abuse the prophetic or abuse the supernatural or roll on the ground when it's not really the power of God um, or fake miracles or manifest in ways that they're trying to conjure something up in their flesh, um, that doesn't mean that people can't fall under the power of God. Like when the soldiers came to see Jesus, for example, they said, are you the one we're looking for? And he says, I am. And they and all felt at the dedication of Solomon's temple. When the Holy Spirit came in the temple and all the priests uh, could not stand to minister. Uh, well, most likely they were standing and they just crumpled to the ground um, or fell to the ground in a, a worshipful way. Uh, so, yeah, there's evidence in the Bible that that can take place. Right. And we want to judge something by its proper use, not by its abuse. So if we see abuse of prophecy, you're going to yeah. see that. Pardon me? I said that's a powerful statement. Right. Uh, I've got to use that. Yeah. I didn't invent it. It comes from Christian apologists I like. They say that about the Christian worldview. The worldview itself has been abused throughout history, but you don't judge a philosophy by its abuse. You judge it by its proper use. Same with the gifts. There's a reason why Paul puts up systems of accountability, tells you to test everything and hold fast to that, which is true, because it's easy to despise prophecy. That's why he says despise not prophecy, because it's probably one of the easiest gifts to despise, because it's easy to abuse. Um, one of the testers, though, that you said is it doesn't witness with your spirit. So if you're walking in a solid relationship with God, you're a devoted follower of, of Jesus, you're all in and you see a move of God or an apparent move of God come over a place and you have alarm bells going off in your spirit and you feel the Holy Spirit telling you, no, no, that's not me. That's not me. There's not this witness of holiness. Like if you were in Solomon's temple or on the outside and the glory of God fell and all the priests fell down, it would be this holy experience. It would bear witness with you. Um, so I guess one of the ways to test something would be what's the witness in your spirit. Um, how do, what, what do you believe God is communicating to you about this? Um, but yeah, I believe in the gifts and the power of the spirit are for today. Uh, some other good resources I would recommend real quickly to people would be um, Dr. Craig Keener, uh, D.A. Carson. He's a, a seminary professor at Trinity Evangelical Seminary. Uh, reformed guys, Calvinist guys, but they believe the gifts continue. He has a book called Showing the Spirit, a theological commentary on first corinthians 10 to 12 you'd want to get to showing the spirit by d.a carson um another good reference would be martin lloyd jones even matt chandler even there's lots of really biblically solid charismatics so like you said i don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater and think that just because certain areas of the body of christ or certain churches or communities every conference is a twitch fest or has impartation where people are uh, manifesting in very scary ways that don't bear witness to you that therefore there's no such thing as um, the gifts of the spirit. There's no such thing as real tongues or real prophecy or really falling under the power of God, just because Satan is mimicking something. Um, he always mimics something. That's his business. He masquerades as an angel of light. Um, all well, that to he be. Can only, he can only counterfeit the true. And so for everything the enemy does, there's a, a, a true manifestation. Uh, uh, Psychic phenomenon is just a, a counterfeit of the true prophetic uh, giftings that God can give. Right. And so I want, I want you to share um, this testimony of, of God's goodness and his miracle working ability uh, that you shared with me last time we were on call. This is the coolest testimony regarding the gifts of the spirit that um, I've ever heard where when you were in India doing ministry there and uh, you described to me that the gifts of the spirit literally saved your life. And I, when you said that, when you said that, I was like, okay, let's hear it. And it's actually true. So please share that, uh, that testimony with us. Yeah, I believe I would probably be dead 
had not God intervened that night. I was ministering in a city called Cumbaconum, and I'm praying that India will open up again where we can have these open air meetings. Uh, they were so powerful back in the day when it was allowed. Uh, I was the first Western missionary to hold a gathering in uh, this uh, central place in the middle of town surrounded by seven huge Hindu temples. Some of the temples could house 10, 15,000 people or more at one time. And there was a labyrinth of uh, corridors underneath the city that were, uh, that were built into the whole structure of the city where you could go from one temple to the other and the whole corridor would be lined with little alcoves and individual gods in those alcoves uh, with fruits and flowers offered to those gods. So the whole city is given over to idolatry. And here I am right in the middle of it, preaching the gospel for the first time they've ever had an outdoor meeting that they knew of. And, and we had, I don't know, four or 5,000 people attending. And I felt while I was preaching the whole time, like I was being choked. And it was the strongholds, demonic strongholds in that community, I'm sure, that were being threatened and the, and the spiritual force was against me. I had to almost push every word out. And I knew the ignorance of the people uh, concerning the word of God. They had no idea. They didn't understand Jesus born of a virgin, dying on a cross, raised from the dead, never heard these things, most of them. And I just could not penetrate that veil of ignorance about the things of God. And I knew if I made an invitation, I wouldn't get any kind of response. And so I was kind of in a dilemma. I'd been preaching an hour with an interpreter and didn't know what to do because I didn't think the people were ready. And all of a sudden, God dropped a word of knowledge in my spirit. And some people say the word of knowledge is just acquired knowledge. They go to a college, they earn a degree in theology, so they have the gift of the word of knowledge. No, that's acquired intellectual understanding. The word of knowledge is supernatural insight into a person or a situation that is God-given, and it doesn't come by learning. And all of a sudden, God dropped this word of knowledge into me, and he said, call for the deaf and tell them, if what you preached is true, every deaf person will hear again. And if what you preach is not true, they can throw you out of their city. And I tell people, I'd like to say I acted on that word of knowledge with total boldness and no fear, but I was shaking like a leaf inside. <laughs> but I knew I had to be obedient. So I made that statement. And as boldly as I could assert, I said, bring the deaf. God's going to heal them to verify what I preached tonight is true. They brought me seven deaf people. Four of them were totally deaf. Three were deaf in one ear. And the first thought that went through my mind is you better pray for one of the ones with one deaf ear first and get the ball rolling and then uh, pray for the totally deaf people. And I got angry at that thought. And so I said, intentionally, I said, bring me somebody totally deaf, not knowing that my life was hanging in the balance on what was about to happen. So they brought me a 23-year-old young man that had been deaf for five years. I started praying for him. I laid hands on him. And just as Jesus would, if we're going to get his results, we've got to use his methods. I was rebuking the deaf spirit and commanding him to hear again uh, by the power of the name of Jesus. And all of a sudden, I heard this crunching, crashing sound behind me. I didn't know that there were six Hindu men who were radical Hindus. Most Hindu people are very gentle and tolerant people. I love that culture that, that promotes uh, tolerance like they do. But especially in more recent years, there's a radical element that's worked its way in as a, a, a boomerang, a reaction against the revival of Christianity that's taken place in India. But anyway, these six Hindus uh, had uh, agreed among themselves that they were going to storm the platform at a certain point, beat me up publicly, then tie me to the bumper of their car and drag me through the city until I was dead. I talked with them the next day and I said, why did you want to do that? They said, we wanted to discourage missionary activity in our town. I said, well, if you had achieved your goal, if I could have felt anything, I sure would have felt discouraged. Uh, but God set it up so powerfully, so miraculously, because anyway, they had this sledgehammer. They were 
stealthily walking up the dark steps at the back side of the platform. There was a 20 foot high gate with a big padlock, a great big padlock on it to prevent break-ins. And they brought a sledgehammer with them. And so right when I was praying for this young man to get his healing, they start hitting that padlock. And, and it totally distracted me. It distracted all the preachers on the platform. They were all turning around, looking, wondering what was going on. And all of a sudden, the lock fell to the concrete. The door, the gate swung open. And these six men came running toward me with this angry, fierce look on their faces. But at the same time, so perfectly designed by my Savior, my Redeemer. At the same time, the young man I was praying for jerked out of my hands and started screaming, I can hear, I can hear for the first time in five years, I can hear. And the leader of this radical Hindu group stopped in his tracks and walked over and started whispering to the guy. And he repeat back his words and he shook his head, amazed, stunned. And he called his men over and they started checking whether or not he could hear. And they were all nodding their heads to each other saying, it is a miracle. It is a miracle. I didn't find out until the next day that the head of the radical Hindu group was the next door neighbor of the guy that got healed. What a divine setup. So he knew it was not uh, something fake that I had orchestrated to coerce the people into believing. He knew it was legitimate. And so I didn't know these guys came to beat me up. So I prayed for the second person and the second person got their healing and the third and the fourth and the fifth. And strangely, I, I thought this group that had verified the first miracle was probably appointed by the pastors. I had about uh, 15 supporting pastors. I thought they had appointed that group to verify the miracles for the people. So I had them check the second person, the third person, they verified this one is hearing too. This one is hearing too. All seven people got their hearing back and I gave an invitation and hundreds of Hindu people came forward and gave their lives to the Lord. But like you mentioned, uh, I probably would have, uh, I probably would have been dead that night had not God given me a word of knowledge and had not God confirmed the gospel with healings, with supernatural signs and wonders. Sometimes I think, though, in American Christianity, the signs and wonders we seek after uh, don't have real value. Some of the signs and, and wonders are just uh, weird things that people go after because they're intrigued. But there's a value when it's a sign that confirms the gospel and causes doubting people to truly believe. And that's when God confirms the word with signs and wonders, just like he did in the very beginning. Right. And that would be, that would be, that's, a, that's like an, that's an unbelievable, unbelievable testimony. Unbelievable. That would be contrasted with like a feather, an angel feather popping into the atmosphere or like some obscure looking glory cloud manifesting over in the corner somewhere that you can't really make out. Like that doesn't confirm anything. It's not giving God glory or validating the gospel. Whereas this how many people did you say got saved and gave their life to the Lord that day? I don't know exactly, but it was hundreds, probably about 500 people gave their hearts to the Lord. And did you say it was seven deaf people who got healed? Yes, seven deaf seven people. Seven deaf people resulting in... Four of them were totally deaf. That's amazing. Um, that's and really amazing. Alive, there's people alive over in India uh, that were there uh, that remember what God did that night. Praise God. Oh, and, and let me include uh, another really beautiful sideline story to that. There was a businessman in town who was a very prominent businessman who had lost everything. He'd gone bankrupt. And uh, he was living on the street with his mother where they'd beg for enough rice every day just to barely survive. And he had made up his mind that very day, that was the opening night of our crusade in Cumbacona that he was going to commit suicide, he and his mother were going to pack together to end their lives, hoping that they would be reincarnated in a better life, that it was too degrading for him to live on the street the way he was. And so he was walk he had begged all day long to get enough money to go buy two packs of poison. And he was on his way back 
to give that other pack to his mother and they were going to kill themselves. And he walked by the field where we were having this crusade. And he got there about halfway through the meeting. He heard about half of my message, but he saw the people get healed. He saw the manifestation of the power of God. He was one of those who came forward and gave his life to the Lord. And the next day he requested an audience with me and he came and brought those two packs of poison and handed them to me. And he said, I don't need these anymore. If I have to live on the street the rest of my life and beg for food every day, I can do it with joy in my heart because now I know God and he's in my life. And uh, wow, I'll just never forget that. I wish we'd had social media back then. <laughs> Well, I could have stayed in touch with the guy. I have no idea where he is now or what his name was even. But uh, wow, what a wonderful, wonderful uh, way of God intervening in a person's life at the last minute. And I hope this interview that we've done is going to intervene that dramatically in some people's lives uh, because God's ready to do it if people are ready to receive. Amen. How about to close off i wasn't planning on doing this but do you want to pray do you want to each take turns praying for people just praying for the audience and just yeah I, i'd like in fact if it's all right with you i'd like to lead a prayer first Absolutely. i don't believe, i don't believe in um a ritualistic prayer where you have to repeat certain words in order to be saved and i don't believe everyone who prays the prayer of salvation actually gets saved because just repeating a prayer doesn't mean you actually are surrendered in your heart and inviting Jesus to be Lord of your life. You can go through the motions. So it's not the prayer, but the root motive behind the prayer that is most powerful. And I'd like to invite anyone, especially somebody into yoga or Eastern religions that's been listening to this, to just pray this prayer with me. Just close your eyes and, and, and in your heart of hearts, humble yourself before the Lord and just say these words or something very similar to these words with all of your heart. Just say, Lord Jesus, I acknowledge you as the Savior of the world. I repent of my sins. Come into my heart. I surrender my heart to you. I renounce all false religious practices. I renounce all other religious ideas except you. As Lord of my life, I receive you and I receive the gift of salvation that you promised. You said, he who believes on me has everlasting life. So by faith, I receive the gift of eternal life in Jesus name. Amen. And Father, I just pray for any person and every person that prayed that prayer or those that are struggling to find themselves spiritually, that the power of the Holy Spirit will go to them, the reality of your love will come upon them, that they will have an encounter with the true and the living God, not a cosmic force, but a personal God who loves them with an everlasting love. And Lord Jesus, I pray that you will manifest yourself to them, just as I've known you to manifest yourself to sincere Hindus and Muslims and people of different faiths that were seeking you and didn't know even what name to call on. And then they would have visitation where they would meet the Lord Jesus Christ and know that you are truly the way, the truth, and the life. I pray that you will manifest yourself to those who are seeking after you and let these questions be resolved in their minds by the power of an encounter with God and by the word of God that upholds this encounter and declares it to be true. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And Lord, I want to ask you to lead them and guide them uh, in anything they need to throw out, anything they need to discard their life of, Lord. Would you highlight it to them, Lord? Would you even bring it to their mind right now, Jesus? Holy Spirit, we ask that you would bring to mind and to heart anything in their life that needs to be discarded, thrown out, whether it's a book, a clothing item, anything that represents their former life in yoga or in the new age or any other religion, Lord, we ask that you would help them uh, walk out that area of repentance in their life, Lord. And we just ask for complete and total spiritual breakthrough right now in Jesus name over everyone who's listening, Lord, that anyone who's oppressed right now spiritually would be set free in Jesus name by the power of the spirit. Mm 
Mm-hmm. We just ask for mental, uh, mental breakthrough and depression and anxiety. We ask for deliverance from any spirit that's come in through yoga practice, through new age practice. God, we ask that you would yes. lift that off of them right now in the name of Jesus and that their life would be saturated with the presence of God and that you would come upon them in power, that they would sense your sweet presence, that you would encourage them, fill them with joy, fill them with your love. And we ask that you would just take their hand and begin to lead them uh, in their new uh, salvific walk with you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. And uh, Steve, uh, I haven't mentioned this thus far. I'd like to invite the people that listen to this uh, interview to come to the website that we just built called thetruelight.net. And don't forget to use the word the, the thetruelight.net. And we'll have quite a few testimonies of people that have come out of various religions, especially Eastern religions, New Age spirituality, who have found the Lord. In fact, we're going to include your testimony in a video on your testimony in the near future. But I would love for them to come there. I also have a podcast called Revealing the True Light, and they can come to that website and sign up for it uh, on YouTube or Google Play or a lot of other sources for podcasts. And they can come to my ministry website too, which is shreveministries.org, the truelight.net and shreveministries.org. And uh, we want to be a blessing to the body of Christ and to those who are seeking. Absolutely. And I'll include uh, links to his website, everything he just said in the description of this video. And for those who would like to follow up with his work, I would recommend In Search of the True Light, um, quite a quite a hefty work in comparative religions for people who want to really be able to see worldview distinctions. Um, it's pretty impressive. And seven reasons I no longer practice yoga. I believe this is available in ebook format now as well. Uh, yes, it should be posted. Uh, it should be posted now. Uh, we, in the last few days, have completed the ebook and getting it on Amazon. So if it's not available right this moment, it will be within the next couple of days. Okay. And there's an ebook version of In Search of the True Light as well, correct? Yes, absolutely. It is available. Awesome. So I'll include all that in the description, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Um, I sincerely hope this has been eye-opening for you. It's been a blessing to you. And uh, don't forget to subscribe for more content like this. And thank you so much, Mike, for uh, for joining us all today and being a blessing to us. God bless you. All right. God bless you guys. And I will see you guys in the next video.